So we want to continue our study in understanding God's truth accurately. We saw something about God and the origin of Satan yesterday. That's important for us to know because it's important for us to know how sin originated. Because when you know how sin originated among the angels first and then in the human race, then you know what is the root of sin. See, we live in a world where the sin is mostly understood as murder, adultery and theft. But sin did not begin with murder, adultery or theft. It began with pride, which most people in the world don't even consider to be a sin and which most Christians don't consider to be a sin and which most Christians don't even have light on. Spiritual pride, most Christians don't have light on it. That's a sin of Lucifer. Sin began in Lucifer with rebellion against authority. When a wife does not submit to her husband, does she realize that she's in fellowship with the devil? No. When a child rebels against his parents, does he realize he's in fellowship with the devil? No. Why? Because they have not understood the truth accurately. And when the husband who expects his wife to submit to him does not recognize that he also has a head in Christ and if he does not submit to Christ, how can he expect his wife to submit to him? He's also in fellowship with the devil. Christendom is full of families who are in fellowship with the devil and we expect God to bless us. It is not possible. We need to see the root of sin. It's pride. It's rebellion. When students make fun of their teachers in school, do they realize they're in fellowship with the devil? No. How many of you make fun of your teachers and your parents listen to that and laugh at it? Everybody in fellowship with the devil and they come on Sunday and say, oh God bless us. How can he bless people who are in fellowship with the devil at home during the week? We need to see the root of sin, pride, rebellion, and uh, discontentment. Uh, Lucifer was not happy with the position God gave him. He wanted something more. God gave him a wonderful position. He was not happy with that. And when you're not content with the way God made you, you don't like your features, you wish God had made you prettier or taller or shorter or thinner or fatter or whatever, you're in fellowship with the devil. Discontentment. When you're not happy with the parents God give you, when you're not happy with the country you were born in, when you were not happy with the home you live in, you're in fellowship with the devil. You see the tremendous value of understanding the truth accurately. What is the root of sin? How did the devil become the devil? By pride, rebellion, discontentment. Beware of these three things in your life, in any area. Don't rebel against the elders in your church. You can leave the church, that's okay. Go and join another church. I've left many churches in my life, but I never stayed in a church and caused rebellion. God has blessed me when I've left a church because I felt they were not preaching the whole counsel of God. Joined another church and found they were not preaching the whole counsel of God. I was young. I didn't have a spiritual father like many of you have. So I had to sort of find my way. I was like an orphan in a sense. So I had to seek the Lord myself. I made a lot of mistakes. But I left one church and went to another and went to another and hardly ever found any spiritual fathers in any of them and um, sought for that which proclaimed the whole counsel of God. So leaving a church and going to another because you find that is better is perfectly okay. But staying in a church and keeping on criticizing it and rebelling against the elders is wrong. It's better to leave that church and sit at home because rebellion 1 Samuel 15 says is like witchcraft. When you rebel against authority, whether wife against husband or 
children against parents or students against teachers, making fun of teachers, criticizing them, or rebelling against your boss at work, or against government authorities or any authority God has placed. It, it says in 1 Samuel 15 <clears throat> that <clears throat> rebellion is like witchcraft, 1 Samuel 15, 23. <clears throat> and insubordination is like idolatry. When I don't submit to authority that God has placed over me, it's my, like my practicing black magic. It's like my practicing idolatry. You think it's only other people who practice idolatry? There are multitudes of Christians who practice idolatry. Husbands who expect their wives to submit to them but who do not submit to Christ themselves. Idolatry. Wives who do not submit to their husbands, children who don't submit to their parents, students who don't submit to their teachers, servants who don't submit to their masters, meaning the bosses in your place of work. It's all rebellion. It's the spirit of the world today because the devil is the ruler of this world. Rebellion is like witchcraft and uh, insubordination is like iniquity. It could be in small things, it could be in big things. Sometimes we don't realize it. We don't realize, you know, we expect others to submit to us. But we don't submit to any authority God has placed over us. That is a fundamental problem. And if you ask yourself, do you expect those who are under you to submit to you? But do you submit to people who are over you in the Lord? No. And you get upset with somebody who does not submit to you. Uh, well, isn't that unrighteous? The Roman centurion understood, I'm a man under authority. Then I can tell other people who are under me to go. So this principle of authority is something that God established right from the beginning of creation. God is the ultimate authority. The Bible says even Jesus submitted to the Father on earth. He never did what he wanted to do. That's how he overcame the spirit of rebellion that was found in Satan. He overcame the spirit of pride by humbling himself. Satan wanted to go up, Jesus came down. Satan was discontent with his situation. Jesus was perfectly content with whatever situation the father placed him in 30 years in an imperfect home in Nazareth. And those who have been gripped by the spirit of Christ, which is the spirit of submission, the spirit of contentment, the spirit of humility, the spirit of going down, are the ones whom the Lord will use to build his body today. We have to take it very seriously. The Lord told King Saul, Go and kill all the Amalekites and go and kill all their sheep. Saul obeyed in everything. He obeyed 99%. But he kept some of the good sheep. You know what happened? He lost the kingdom. Because God expects a lot from rulers and those who are leaders. You think that's very strict of God just to make a man not king because he didn't kill the good sheep? Uh, God told Moses once, go and speak to that rock. The second time when he was asked to get water from the rock, Numbers 20. Moses, Moses went and hit the rock like he did the first time. You know what was his punishment? He could not go into the land of Canaan, which he had been expecting to go into for 40 years. It's a pretty severe punishment. But God expects more from leaders. And if you are a husband, you're a leader, God expects more from you than from your wife and children. If you're an elder, God expects more from you than from everybody else in your church. I'll give you one example. For many, many years, 
I've heard complaints from many churches that our elders speak too long and they are boring. And I have repeatedly told elders for years, speak for 20 minutes. You think they listen to me? No. I think 1% of elders listen. Elders. They expect everybody in their church to be submitted to them. But the spirit of rebellion is in them. No wonder God doesn't bless. He will never bless. You have to be under authority before you can have authority. God does not commit authority to you. I've seen that for many years here in CFC, 25 years, when I tell a brother, speak for so many minutes, he doesn't listen to me. He thinks he's a big person. He doesn't have to listen to me. Fine. Unfortunately, I'm responsible for this conference. I'm just telling you what happens behind the scenes. From elder brothers, this is the reason why the blessing of God is not in our churches. In many of our churches, because the elders think they are too important. They want everybody to submit to them. They don't submit themselves. There are husbands who expect their wives to submit to them. They don't submit to what older brothers tell them. Then you don't deserve to have your wife submit to you. I believe your wife should be rebellious to you, just like you are rebellious to those above you. I'm just telling you that we have to reap what we sow. We can't sow bad seed and expect good seed in a harvest. No. We have to learn to submit. God is my witness that for 30 years I have traveled in different places in the world. Some places they tell me to speak for 15 minutes. I speak 15 minutes and I sit down. Some other places they say this is a wedding, speak for 25 minutes. I speak 25 minutes and sit down. I never ask other people to do what I haven't done myself. I will never do it. I submit to authority wherever I go. Even in the churches I've planted, or the Lord has planted through us. I listen to the elders. If they tell me that the meeting is so long and you've got to speak for so long, I submit. To elders whom I appointed. That's like saying when I go to my married children's home, I don't even pray at the table. I allow my children whom I brought up to pray at the head of the table. I allow them to sit at the head of the table. I will not sit even if they ask me to sit there because I'm not the head in their home. I respect authority even in the homes of my married children. You know why? Because God has opened my eyes to see that way back in the beginning, the big issue was the issue of authority. And I have learned to submit to authority. You think my children are more spiritual than me or more perfect than me? It's got nothing to do with spiritual or perfect. Jesus submitted to Joseph and Mary and I have learned a lesson from my Savior. It's not a question of whether the elder or the one in authority is more perfect or not. It's a question of has God put somebody in authority somewhere? Submit. My dear brothers and sisters, I tell you this because I believe this is a fundamental problem which is the reason why the blessing of God has not come on many, many people. Yeah, <clears throat> but God doesn't impose his authority on anybody and neither do I. I tell people and then I leave it. I say it's up to you, you can do what you like because that's how God does with us. God tells us something and he leaves us. If you don't want to listen, don't listen. He doesn't sort of sit on our heads all the time. Come on, do it, do it, do it like this. And neither do I. It's so important to learn this. And I hope you young people will learn. I hope you will have examples whom you can learn from. I can certainly say in this area, follow me as I follow Christ. There's no place on the face of the earth. And I've traveled many, many countries where anybody will be able to say to me that I did not submit to local authority, whether it's a small church or my children's home or anywhere. Because I have been gripped by this truth, I understood it accurately, that the first sin in the universe 
was rebellion against authority and I have laid the axe to the root of that in my life. It has brought victory over sin in my life. Do you wonder why you don't have victory over anger? It's a matter of authority. Do you wonder why you don't have victory over the lust of your eyes? It's a matter of submitting to authority. When you submit to authority, God mightily blesses you. I can testify to that through more than 25, 30 years. I recognize in my own home, do you know that the Bible says that a husband must submit to his wife? Have you read that? None of you husbands have found that in the New Testament? I'm not joking. We are so selective in our reading. We are going to understand the truth accurately now for the disturbance of some husbands and the excitement of some wives. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. You say, hey, Brother Zach, that's not what you said. No, that's not what I said. R read the previous verse. All of you be subject to one another. Wives, husbands, be subject to your wives. Verse 21. And then, <laughs> wives, be subject to your husbands. Verse 22. Why is it we read verse 22 and not verse 21? No wonder you don't have power. You're selective in your reading of scripture. I take verse 21 and 22. You say, Brother Zach, how do you submit to your wife? First of all, by giving her freedom to live according to her conscience. Not forcing her to do something which she's still not convinced that she should do. Not interfering in areas of her life like the kitchen and domestic matters which God has given her an area of responsibility. Respecting her as a human being, as an individual who needs to be respected. I submit to her and she submits to me in areas where I have responsibility. I'm not God. If I were God, she'd have to submit to me in everything. I'm not God. She has to submit to me in the areas where God has given me a responsibility. I have to submit to her in the areas where God has given her. For example, children. Do I submit to my children? Sure. Even when they were small. If they did something wrong, when some guest was visiting our home, I would not punish them because that would be a double humiliation, double punishment. First, the physical punishment, and the second, the humiliation before the visitor. So, I'd ignore it. After the visitor is gone, I would settle my accounts with my children. Why did I do that? Because I submitted to the fact that God has given even my little children a dignity as a human being, and I must respect that. And I did it. You go and ask my children whether I ever, ever punish them in the presence of visitors. Do you know that nobody has got absolute authority? Some fathers think, I've got absolute authority over my children. No. Some husbands think, I've got absolute authority over my wife. No. Understand that only God has got absolute authority. The devil wanted absolute authority. That's why he became the devil. And if you want absolute authority, you'll become the devil too. So these are little principles. If you understand the root of sin, you can be delivered from many, many problems. You know, many of us, the problem is we have not put the ax to the root and the fruit is coming out, coming out, coming out and we are trying to get victory here, victory there, victory there and always defeated. Lay the ax to the root. Understand the truth accurately that the first sin in the universe was pride, rebellion, and discontentment. 
That is why I say, treat people with respect. I can't spurn a beggar because he's made in the image of God. I can't speak rudely to him. It says in James chapter 3, if you're not familiar with that verse, verse 9, it says all human beings are made in the likeness of God. There's something of the likeness of God even in a poor beggar, in a non-Christian. That's why I don't despise a Hindu who worships an idol. Because there's something of the image of God in him. Maybe he's wrong. A lot of Christians are wrong. I don't despise them. If you only valued those who were right, you wouldn't be able to value anybody on the face of the earth, not even me. Because I'm not right in every area. If we are humble, we'll recognize that we ourselves have not become completely in the likeness of God ourselves. And that every human being has got something of the likeness of God in him, according to James 3.9. And I respect that. That's why I can't shout at someone and get angry with someone, even if he's much lower than me in society. Because there's something of the image of God in him. I want to tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, things I have learned in my life that have helped me tremendously learn to value human beings, learn to respect authority. I'm sorry to say that some of you young people, particularly you get a little educated, and on top of that, unfortunately, if you get a good salary and you're from a rich family, you may not know it, but I have seen in some of our churches, they are some of the most conceited young people I have seen on the face of the earth. Because they got a little education, they come from a rich family, and they get a good salary. And some of them in the days when they were students and didn't earn anything, they were okay. But then they got good jobs, and it went to their heads, and they became like the devil. I'm talking about people in our churches. It's sad, it grieves my heart. And I think how much more it grieves the heart of God. People who are going to be useless to God in the next generation, because they have not laid the ax to the root. Shall I tell you what to pursue? Pursue humility. Pursue submission to authority wherever you find it. One day God will give you authority yourself, but till then submit to authority. And even if you're 90 years old, if you find authority somewhere, submit to it. If I live to see my grandchildren married, I'll go to their home and submit to their authority because I have learned the secret. I will have nothing to do with the spirit of Lucifer in my life. I'm 100% in fellowship with the spirit of Christ who submitted to authority wherever he was. Dear brothers and sisters, learn to follow Jesus in this area. He humbled himself. He never wanted to go up. He always wanted to go down. He always wanted to take the low place. He never wanted a title, never expected any honor from anybody, never expected people to appreciate him and honor him and respect him. Always went down, content with what God had given him. There was no sin in him. And I want to become like him, free from all sin. We can now look at Genesis chapter 3 and see the origin of sin in man. You see, these are things nobody learns in any Bible school. They study Greek and Hebrew in a Bible school and live in sin and become pastors and preachers and Bible school lecturers. But you're hearing things here that will prepare you for heaven and prepare you for a ministry on earth before you get to heaven. All your zeal and your passion is useless if your character is not changed. Our service must be the outflow of our character. The trouble today is we a lot of people are serving God. It's not the outflow of their character. That's a sad thing. In Genesis chapter 3, you see the origin of sin in man. How, is, how did it come? God had given him only one commandment. 
don't eat from one tree. There were thousands of trees. Adam could have gotten, eat, gone and eaten the pineapples and the oranges and the apples and <laughs> all the wonderful fruit there was. And above all, the tree of life. But instead of that, he went to the one tree which God had said, don't do. You know, that nature is in us. You can see that in children. Supposing you leave a little child in a room and tell that child, you can do anything in this room, play with anything, but that, you know, that last drawer there, don't ever open that. You test it out. As soon as you leave the room, that'll be the first thing he opens. <laughs> you can prove that he's got the nature of Adam. I can prove it to you in your child. <laughs> Unless you have trained him to submit to authority and obedience, but it's very difficult to train a child to do that. It's like that with us too. The things that God tells us don't, we go for that. And that's how it was with Adam. But in that sin, there was a lot involved in that sin that we need to understand. We can say that Adam too, was infected with the spirit of discontentment. The devil tried to make Adam and Eve discontent with what God had given them. Lucifer was the head of all the angels and there are millions and millions of them and he was not happy. And one could imagine that if you're the top authority, you should at least be happy then. He wasn't. He was discontent and God gave Adam the whole garden and said you can have the whole thing except this one tree outside the garden don't go there I mean one tree outside the circle the circle God drew a huge circle around Adam said all these trees are yours there's only one tree outside your circle don't go there and he went for that one because he was discontent with what God had given him don't you find that in yourself perhaps you forget about all the things God has given you and you're discontent with the one thing that God hasn't given. Children sometimes fight with their parents saying, I want that sports shoe. It must be Nike or Reebok or something like that. I don't want any of these cheap substitutes. And they don't realize they've got a thousand things that other children don't have. It's like that little statement I read, I complained because I had no new shoes until I saw someone who had no feet. I complained because I did not get new shoes until I saw someone who had no feet. We have to learn, to, we have to teach our children to be thankful for what they have in their homes instead of always comparing themselves with what somebody else has. But parents need to be thankful first. Have you noticed how the devil will always make you compare yourself with somebody who's got more than what you have? Has the devil ever tempted you to compare yourself with somebody who lives in the slum? I remember once a couple came to me with some complaint and I said, before I talk to you, I said, I want you to go to those slums. It's just about a kilometer away. Go and walk through those slums for half an hour and come back and tell me if you have any complaints. They came back and said, no, Brother Zach, we have no more complaints. I didn't give them any exhortation. I didn't give them any scripture. I just told them to walk through the slums for half an hour. Tell your children to do that. Husbands and wives, do it. Before we complain that we don't have this in the house and we need that in the house and we need the other thing and this house is not big enough and this and that and the other and the other and the other, go and take a half an hour walk through the slums. We are such a spoilt group of people, discontent, no matter what, I tell you, if God gave you a hundred times more than what you have now, I guarantee you'll still be discontent because it's a spirit. 
It's a spirit which always wants more and more and more and more. Like it says in the book of Proverbs, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> verse 15 of chapter 30, Proverbs 30, 15, the leech has got two daughters. And it says, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me more. The leech has got many, many more children than that now. It's never satisfied. Once a leech latches onto your leg, it doesn't, it's never satisfied. It can be bloated with your blood. It'll still suck for more till it drops off. There are three things that will never be satisfied, four that never say it's enough. Hell, hell never says, we got enough people here. <laughs> never. It says, send more. The barren womb is never happy, wants more. The earth, it always wants more and more water. And the fire, no matter what you put into it, it'll say, I can burn some more, send more. And the fifth, many believers who are never satisfied with what God gave them. It's the spirit of Lucifer, it's the spirit of Adam. How to counter that spirit? By learning to give thanks. Thank you, Lord. I'm thankful for everything. That's why the new covenant, it says, in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There are many areas where we don't know the will of God. A thousand areas where we don't know God's will. What 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, There's one area where we all know the will of God. It's very clear. And that is, In everything give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So, in the one area where God has already shown his will, let's begin there. One of the things I decided many years ago to completely eliminate from my life was murmuring and complaining. Give thanks for what God has given me. If God has kept certain trees outside my boundary, Lord, thank you. You don't want me to touch those trees. If God says those cinema posters, that internet pornography is outside the boundary, Lord, thank you. I'm not going to look at all that. I'm content with what God has given me. It's because we are not content with what God has given us. We are not content with health. We're not content with the wonderful blessings God has given us that we are forever seeking like Adam and Eve for something outside. We have to learn to give thanks. Don't drive out the demon of murmuring and complaining and leave your heart empty. That demon will come back with seven other demons and make you more discontent. When you drive out the demon of discontent and complaining from your heart, replace it with a spirit of thanksgiving. Fill your heart with thanksgiving. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful things in the world which are much better than internet pornography and much better than those filthy movies and much better than all those cinema posters. Lord, I thank you for so many good things I can set my mind on, that I can look at, that I can enjoy. I don't need movies. To relax and be entertained. There are so many good things I can enjoy and can be thankful for. And I'm not thankful, then those demons will come back. And I, I see that happening in some people. They start by seeing ordinary clean movies and it's just a matter of time before they move into filthier movies and filthier and always say, well, I can always fast forward those bad scenes. Uh-huh. <laughs> the devil's really got you. And I tell you the sad thing, young people, even your parents, who are supposed to be God-fearing people, don't tell you what's good for you. Your parents are responsible. One day when you go to hell, God will ask your parents who are in heaven, why did you send your children to hell? Your parents better wake up. Some of our children are going in the wrong direction. And you're the ones who haven't stopped them. 
You are the ones who have not stopped them because you don't think that's serious. Ask yourself, is that something the Lord Jesus would endorse? Have you left your first love? Have you gone back from the stand you took against impurity and filth many years ago? Are you content with what God has given you or you're always reaching out for the one or two things God has forbidden? This is the spirit of Adam and Eve. God had given them so much, but they were not content with that. They always wanted those one or two things that God has forbidden. Why? Beware of reaching out for the one or two things God has forbidden. He hasn't forbidden a million things. There are a million things he allows us to enjoy. The Bible says God has richly given us all things to enjoy. When he's given you so much of good food to eat. I mean in the new covenant he's even allowed you to eat pork. For those who like it, I don't like it. But if you like it he's even allowed you to eat that. Why in the world do you want to go and eat poison? And when God has given you so many good things to enjoy, why do you want to go for one or two things which are poisonous to your mind, which worldly people go after? Because you want to carry on a conversation with your friends? Tell your friends, I don't know anything about that subject. I believe we need a revival. Coming back to our first love. To the type of devotion that some of us had to Jesus 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Please consider whether you have slipped up. There's nothing wrong in acknowledging, Lord, I've lowered my standards, but I want to come back. I've lowered the standards in my home. I would never have permitted this 20, 30 years ago, but I do now. But I want to come back to this weekend, this week. I want to come back to you, Lord. I'm ashamed, but I want to come back. Help me. Forgive me for the wrong I did. Forgive me for leading my family down the pathway to hell. I want to turn around. Don't be discontent with what God has given you. The other thing we see in this temptation is the choice between my will and God's will. So root of sin is God's will was don't eat of that tree. But Eve said, I feel like doing it. So it's a clash between my will and God's will. It's not that God's will was not clear. In some areas we know God's will is not clear. But in certain areas we know very clearly that what God's will is. You know in your spirit what God's will is concerning areas of purity, concerning areas of relationships. And Adam and Eve knew clearly what God's will was in relation to that forbidden tree. But they wanted it. Here was God's will and here was man's will. It clashed. And Adam and Eve said, God, nevertheless, not your will, but mine. That's how sin came. How did salvation come? When another man said, Father, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. You see the difference between Adam and Christ? Adam said, not your will, but mine. Jesus said, not my will, but thine. All of us are following Adam and or Christ in different situations in life. Your will wants to do something. You want to react in a certain way to somebody. You want to speak to someone, do something, and you know what your will is and you know what God's will is. You know what the cross is? Where your will crosses God's will and you die on it and you say, nevertheless, I want it, Lord, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And you follow Jesus. It may be something you want very much. Jesus wanted very much that the cup should be removed. And it may be something you want very much. There's nothing wrong in saying that to God. Jesus said it to God, the Father. Father, please remove this cup. But if that's not your will, I'll drink it. 
even though it was painful even though it was so difficult there's a hymn which one of those hymns which <laughs> i like to read now and then my god my god can it be that i take sin so lightly and one verse in it goes ever when tempted make me see my god alone with hands outstretched bleeding on the earth that he made and make me feel that it was my sin as though no other sins were there and my sin was to him who bears the world a load that he could scarcely bear I often I often say that to myself ever when tempted make me see beneath the olive's moon pierced shade my god alone all stretched and bruised and bleeding on the earth he made and make me feel it was my sin as though no other sins were there that was to him who bears the world a load that he could scarcely bear i say that to myself because i want to see that it was my sin that was the load that jesus could hardly bear on the cross he who bore the world could not bear the load of my sin and little things like this make me hate sin more make me want to go opposite to the way adam went understand the truth accurately what sin is the price that jesus had to pay to bear your sin the sins you committed yesterday the sins you are taking so lightly in your life right now how easily eve could just pluck the fruit and eat it <laughs> and the moment she did it christ had to die there was no other way because immediately after that god says okay you guys have messed up but i still love you i will send my son as a seed of the woman genesis 3:14 and the serpent will bruise his heel but this serpent that destroyed your life will be crushed god was faithful to his word genesis 3:15 and sent his son to crush the head of the serpent but the serpent bruised him killed him have we learned something have we learned what it cost god as soon as he put that fruit in our mouth jesus had to come to die and when adam did it too it just compounded the evil my dear brothers and sisters understand the truth accurately concerning sin and what a price jesus had to pay to free us from it whenever you want to do your will when you know god's will is something else take up the cross and say lord because jesus died for me because my sin was a load so heavy that he could not bear it i want to give up sin totally in my life if your wife wants to live in sin let her live in sin you don't do it when adam took the fruit from his wife he was saying god i love my wife more than i love you if she goes to hell i go to hell with her what an idiot if your wife wants to go to hell let her go alone if your husband wants to go to hell let him go alone don't join him he's not your creator god is your creator your first loyalty is not to your husband or your wife it is to god and when your husband or wife hand out to you a juicy mom morsel of sin don't take it and perhaps the stand that you take 
will one day bring your husband or wife into God's kingdom. I believe there are many husbands who are unconverted because their wives don't have the spirit of Christ. And they will remain to be unconverted till the wives learn to have more humility. Many wives who will never be converted because their husbands who talk so much religion don't have the spirit of Christ. The aroma of Christ does not come forth from their words, from their life. You know what is the most important thing that should come forth from us? It is not words, it's aroma. An aroma that comes forth with our words and with our conduct, Spirit of Christ. <clears throat> and I want to say one more thing about Adam's sin. <clears throat> In these two trees were symbolized two principles by which we can live. One is the knowledge of good and evil. When Adam ate that, he got the knowledge of good and evil within him. After that, he did not need to consult God about what is good and what is evil. He could decide himself. And that's why men all over the world, they don't consult God about something they want to do. They say, I know it myself. Why do I need to pray about it? Do you pray about every movie that you watch? Do you pray about every television program that you click onto? No. Why do you need to? You've got the knowledge of good and evil within you. That's exactly what Adam had. And it brought death to Adam and it brings death to you. God never intended man to live that way. God intended man to live by the tree of life which is a picture of life in the Holy Spirit it's not rules and if Adam had gone to that tree it would have been it would have brought the Holy Spirit into him where concerning every action the Holy Spirit would prompt him no that's not good when you turn to the right this voice will say no not that way turn to the left but Adam didn't want that. That's the way of life. That's the way for us today as well. You can live by the principle of knowing good and evil. Where you don't need to pray. You say, I'm not harming anybody. I know what's good and evil. That's, that's exactly the way of death. You know, this answers the question which so many people ask. Why, how can God send all these good people to heaven? It's not a question of their being good or evil. They know what's good and evil. Maybe they're not doing what is evil, but they don't live in dependence on God. Have you understood whom God takes into heaven? Many people think all the good people here, all the evil people here, all the evil people go to hell, all the good people go to heaven. No. It's not divided like that. Here are the people who depend upon God for every decision. Here are the people who take their decisions themselves. That's the dividing line. Which category do you fall into? That's how a lot of good people go to hell. It's not a question of good, it's a question of faith. Faith means who is living a life dependent on God and who is living a life independent of God. Not who is good and who is evil. God did not create man primarily to be good and evil. God created man to live a life dependent on him. That is the tree of life. Tree of knowledge of good and evil is independent of God. I've got the knowledge of good and evil within me. I don't need to pray. Why is it many of you don't pray at all? Shall I tell you why? Listen to it. You can talk about prayer, you can go to prayer meetings, but you do not pray. Be honest. You do not pray. You know why? Ah, you go through rituals of prayer like Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus, Jains, Christians, Roman Catholics, everybody prays. You also pray. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a life of dependence on God where you pray because you want to know God's will. Why don't you do it? I'll tell you why. Because you have the knowledge of good and evil within you. You don't need to pray. Jesus did not live like that. It's a question of a life dependent on God. God, I can't do it without you telling me what to do. So Jesus said it's like the branch in the tree. The branch says to the tree, I can't produce a single fruit without your sap flowing into me. Oh yeah, I've been producing fruit 50 years. But even now I need to be dependent on you, my tree. That's what the branch says. 
That is how God created man to live, dependent upon God. So I'm not asking you whether you're good or evil. I'm not asking you whether you overcome your anger or not. I'm asking you, do you live in dependence upon God? Do you live, oh Lord, I can't do anything without you. I need your help. Please help me. That's why it's so important to judge yourself. After everything you do, judge yourself. You know, I used to punish my children pretty severely because the Bible says that's the way you save them from hell in Proverbs 22 and 23. But I always used to judge myself after I've disciplined my children. Usually I used to go into the toilet and lock the door so that my children wouldn't see me. And many times I would weep there because I didn't do it right. I did it in anger. And I said, Lord, forgive me. Please help me to do it right. I was so desperate that I wanted to do it right. I wanted to do God's will in everything. I remember when I was considering marriage, I said, Lord, I'm a weak single man. I may be tempted suddenly in the moment of stupidity. I may go and say yes to the wrong girl. Please help me, Lord, if I make such a mistake. Believe me, I prayed like this. On the day of my wedding, send an earthquake and disrupt the wedding. I don't want to get married to the wrong person and mess up my whole life. Are you desperate? I remember when I went seeking God for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I was desperate. I went to this church, that church, that church, and I was unhappy with everything. I came back to my room and I said, Lord, it's all humbug what I see everywhere. I don't want it. I don't care if it takes 10 years. I'll seek you. I want the real thing. And God gave me the real thing. I want to ask you, are you desperate? Do you really want God's will in your life in every area? When I preach a sermon, I've been preaching for 45 years. Do you know that even now I go home and judge myself? I ask my wife what she thought about it because she's my only honest critic. <laughs> or if I had some enemies, I'd go and ask them because our enemies will tell us the truth. Our friends don't tell us the truth sometimes. Because I want my preaching to be perfect. I don't want to bore people even for one minute. Because that will be robbing their time. I'm desperate. I tell you, my whole Christian life is desperate. If I have one thought which is wrong, I weep on my pillow and say, God, that was a bitter thought against that person. That's not good. It's not good for me as a disciple of Jesus. Are you desperate? Or are you satisfied with, I, I avoid evil and I do what is good? That's the way of death. I want to live a life in dependence on God continuously. All, every time when I stand here and speak, I want to be dependent on God moment by moment. When I live my life every day, I want to be dependent on God moment by moment. I understand what it means when it says pray always. Pray always means be dependent on God all the time. That's how I want to live. And it's getting better and better. I haven't reached perfection yet. But I know that the more I have learned to depend on God, the less of a legalist I've become. And the more I have learned to encourage people rather than rebuke them. I see so many of our elder brothers, when I hear them, they're only rebuking people. You're like this and you're like that, and you, why are you like this and why are you like that? What they're saying is right, but they don't know God. They're following Moses. They are following the Old Testament prophets, not Jesus Christ and the apostles. Even though we have preached the new covenant for so many years, I'll tell you another thing. I sent a circular to all the elders once some years ago, I think two, three years ago, and I said, brothers, I think we have spent enough years rebuking the saints. I think we should spend many years now just encouraging them. Do you think the elders listen to me? No. <laughs> Why should they listen to me? Who am I? <laughs> they know good and evil. See the result. See the result in their ministry. Go and ask the brothers who listen to their preaching, whether they are edified, encouraged, blessed. They are trying to keep people from sin, but they are not keeping anybody from sin. Because they think they know so much.
Some elders are disturbed when I speak about these things in public. Do you know that the letters to the elders in Revelation 2 and 3 were read out in public? Read it out. The elder of the church of ladies here sitting there and the letter is read out. You wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Boy. <laughs> the guy sitting there listening. Hey, hey, can you give it to me in private? Let me read. No, no, no. John the apostle said, read it out in public. And not only in this church, brother, John told me to read it out in all the other churches too about your condition. Read Revelation 2 and 3. All these conceited ideas that we are such important people that we are not, cannot be corrected is from the devil. We got to humble ourselves. Fall on the face before God and say, God, I'm a zero. I'm nothing. Let me learn to live in dependence on you. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Just bow our heads before God. Heavenly Father, you're a good God. Everything you have told us is for our eternal good. Every rebuke, every correction, every discipline, every word of encouragement is for our eternal good. Help us to learn from scripture, from the mistakes of the angels, from the mistakes of Adam and Eve, that you have written for our instruction that we may not make those same mistakes in our generation. Thank you, you've not only given us words, but you've given us a wonderful example of Jesus himself. Help us to see that more clearly in these days, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.